Everybody, welcome. It's a thrill to see so many supporters of Drayton Hall in attendance, and I applaud you for being here and your continued support of Drayton Hall. I'm Carter C. Hudgens, the president and CEO of Drayton Hall, and on behalf of the board of the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust and our talented staff, I welcome you and thank you. Tonight is tremendous for Drayton Hall, and just to think it was approximately 279 years ago that young John Drayton began the construction of what is today one of colonial America's greatest estates. Just 40 years ago, after seven generations of ownership, the Drayton family passed Drayton Hall to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And now tonight, with great excitement, we launch a public capital campaign to enhance Drayton Hall through an improved visitor experience and through the improved stewardship of resources. I first of all want to thank supporters of Drayton Hall and particularly those of you in attendance who have made a gift to our capital campaign. To those of you that are in the audience who are pondering support of this campaign, I encourage you to talk to myself or any of our, our staff that are in attendance tonight and we'll be hearing more in the program about how to make a gift to the Drayton Hall Reimagine campaign. I'd also like to thank our supporters, our design team, Glenn Keyes and Sheila Wertimer, we'll be hearing more from later this evening, but with great excitement I can today announce our contractor, Hood Construction from Columbia. They're going to be seeing this project through. Uh, tonight definitely is going to be a dynamic evening filled with multimedia, commentary from our design and architecture team and leadership. And at this time, I would like to turn things over to John Yarian of Sea Change Consultants. John has been working alongside our staff with his staff, working on such areas as strategic communication and media relations. And we're fortunate to have John as the moderator tonight. So thanks to everybody for attending. And I'll turn things over to John. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be with you. I suppose in honor of Carter C. Hudgens, I should say I'm Jonathan B. Yarian, your, your moderator tonight. Um, it's fun to be here and I wanna emphasize as we get started, we don't just want to talk at you, we wanna talk with you this evening. So a big part of what we wanna do here is hear from you and take your questions and hopefully start a conversation that's gonna continue long after tonight's event. Uh, this has a lot to do with you. It's obviously part of your community. And for many of you, this is part of your legacy and the way that you do choose to give and support that community. So we very much want to hear your thoughts and opinions. And you'll hear me ask a few questions of the panel and then turn it over to you for your questions so we can interact directly. So be thinking about that. Be ready. Uh, I'm going to come to you a little bit later once the panel is up here. But before we welcome our distinguished panel, I know we've got a video we want to show. It's brief, but should set the stage for the conversation this evening. So if you will, roll that, and then we'll get started. At Drayton Hall, the physical remnants of history surround us, bearing witness to a unique American legacy. If we're willing to listen, they can teach us. This iconic estate in the South Carolina Lowcountry is vital to our understanding of early American history. It is perhaps the most authentic survivor of Southern colonial life that can claim an unbroken bond to its very beginning. The site is a survivor of the Revolution, the Civil War, natural disasters, and the unrelenting pressures of modernity. It is an authority unlike any other, a living witness, an unlikely gift. With your support, the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust will build new facilities, experiences, and educational resources designed to share this gift with future generations. Designed by John Drayton in the late 1730s, this 350-acre estate was the center of his vast commercial plantation empire. The legacy of the family, their contemporaries, and the enslaved inhabitants of the plantation survive today in the home, its landscape, and museum collections. 
Drayton Hall passed through seven generations of family ownership before being transferred to the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 1974. Today, the site, a National Historic Landmark, is operated by the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust. And now, with your support, we will construct modern facilities to share its history. A new welcome area will greet more than 60,000 visitors each year, and an interactive orientation hall will mark the start of their unforgettable journey. A visitor center complex will share the site's rich and complex history, while Drayton Hall's priceless collection of objects and artifacts, many of them not found anywhere else in colonial America, will finally be publicly displayed and interpreted on site. The months ahead will be transformational for Drayton Hall. Because of you, all that Drayton Hall has to say, what only Drayton Hall can say, finally has a chance to be heard. This is Drayton Hall Reimagined. Welcome to our future. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, as the panelists take the stage, I do want to make a quick note. Um, Drayton Hall Preservation Trust Board Chair Steve Gates, who many of you know, is traveling as we speak. He will join us, I think, probably, maybe. You'll know he'll be coming down the stairs when he gets here. And if and when he does, we'll hear from him as well. Um, but in his absence, we have a terrific panel for you who can tell you a little bit more about the inside story of the motivations, the decisions, the influences that led to what you just saw and what we hope to enact over the coming year. I'll ask the panelists, starting with Carter, to introduce themselves briefly. We'll get into some questions. Uh, the questions I'm gonna ask are truly a synthesis of ones that we're already getting. So these are really questions from our supporters, our community, that I wanna give you an opportunity to hear, and then we'll turn it over to you to ask some more questions. But before that, we'll do introductions, and we'll start with Carter. All right, thank you, John. I'm Carter C. Hudgens. I've been at Drayton Hall for about 10 years, C. <laughs> I've been at Drayton Hall for approximately 10 years, serving in various capacities, but today serve as the president and CEO. I'm Glenn Keyes, I'm the architect for the project. I've been practicing in Charleston since 1986, and I'm just delighted to be able to be asked to work on this amazing property. So, looking forward to seeing it come to fruition. Uh, I'm Anthony C. Wood. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm a preservationist, uh, live in New York City, but my involvement with Drayton Hall goes back, family involvement to 1980, and personal involvement since back to 2001. When George, who's here, George, hi, uh, welcomed me onto the board of then the Site Advisory Council, which was the governing body of Drayton Hall at the time, uh, which I ended up chairing for a while, happily, and now am happily on the new uh, nonprofit that uh, is managing and operating Drayton Hall, the Preservation Trust. So delighted to be a bridge between the two periods of time. I'm Sheila Wertimer, no middle initial. And, uh, <laughs> I'm a landscape architect and I've been practicing in Charleston for 30 long years. And I too am thrilled to be here. Thank you. Glenn, do you want to quickly introduce a middle initial or do you want to let it go? <laughs> no, you're good. He's good. Okay. Carter, let's start with you. And we've seen the video. I think most of this audience has an awareness of the project and maybe the broad parameters. We've talked a bit about the structures and some of the purposes of them. I wonder if you could share with us what the first time visitor would experience. If I've, if I've turned right, if I'm coming up 61, I've turned right, I'm driving in, I've never been before, what's this gonna be like for me once we've realized this vision? Absolutely. Well, this is a, a project that is going to leave its mark across the 125 acres that is Drayton Hall. And it really is gonna begin at the front gate. We're looking to construct a new series of gates, associated landscape, a new gatehouse there marking the entrance to the property. From that point forward, there will be a new road system uh, that will move vehicles 
uh, visitors to Drayton Hall into a new parking lot. One of the things that Drayton Hall wrestles with that you've probably all experienced is capacity. We have, as unex unexciting as it may sound, about 30 parking spots. Um, we have a staff of 20 plus. Do the math. Um, so we're looking to expand the parking system. Um, following that, if I can move forward, the real interesting aspect, the, the immediate landscape and architecture around the project shown here. After parking their car, guests will move through an axis uh, that cuts through the parking lot and into the new visitor center. And I think it's worth noting at this point in the conversation that what we're doing, the new visitor center, is going to be named after longtime supporter Sally Reard. Uh, Sally Reard was instrumental in the National Trust acquisition of the property in the 1970s and contributed from the 1970s until her death in the early 2000s to a variety of projects. Um, she left Drayton Hall our endowment, and she's also left funds to support the construction of new facilities. So such a wide range of support, it's only fitting that we name this new facility in her honor. So the Sally Rear Visitor Center, for the guest, um, and I've got a pointer here, there are two wings to the primary visitor center. On the right side, there is a new museum shop. Off of that, there will be new restrooms. On the other side, we will have the Charlie H. Drayton Orientation Hall, where a new eight-minute video clip telling the story of Drayton Hall, the significance and what the offerings are to the visiting public. And then off of that, true excitement that we will finally have gallery space, where we will be able to connect the visiting public to the collections of Drayton Hall. Off of that, and Sheila can speak to this more, there's a courtyard um, anchored by a large live oak, likely planted by Charles Drayton, and in that space we will have an outside gallery, if you will, showcasing horticultural specimens that the Drayton family interacted with in, throughout their history. And then on the way to the main house, what's shown here is the education center. Uh, Drayton Hall is going to construct a new education center, named in honor of Drayton Hall's longtime executive director, George McDaniel. And in that space, it's twofold. Visitors will gather there, they will meet their guide, and then progress over to the house. So it's kind of a launch pad for the experience. Also, you'll notice there are two bays on either side of this uh, that will serve as education spaces where programs suited for students of all ages will be offered. So everything from group tours to uh, K through 12 education experiences will be held in that space. So that's, that is the uh, launch pad to the full visitor experience. Thank you, and just to add on to that, what I'm hearing and, and what I want to convey tonight is an intuitively navigable space. In other words, one that flows from the parking lot through the visitor experience and utilizes every step of the journey for education and not merely for moving from point A to point B, which is a huge distinction and is going to add a lot of value to the visitor experience. So thank you for that. And that's exactly what it's going to deliver. Um, Glenn, I want to pivot a little bit as we think about the built environment, what, what's being constructed there. Talk to us about your inspiration for those designs. And I, knowing the history of the property, knowing what, was, what you were directed to do, we know, the, you know the background and what you probably referenced. I'm curious about your personal inspiration. Was there you know, a moment, a structure, a corner, uh, an edifice, something that spoke to you that influenced the rest of it, or how did you come to this design? Well, as you know, Drayton Hall is probably the greatest Palladian structure in America. So it's a daunting task to think about adding something to those grounds. Um, the site was specifically selected so that you would not see the new construction from the main house. We thought that was very important. Sheila's worked her garden such that it's a, a beautiful space unto itself, but the house is the aha moment when you get past all that. So the looking at the house and thinking about 18th century construction, you know, we wanted to design something that, that was complementary, but obviously not compete with that great Georgian house. So we looked at what we want to use traditional materials, traditional voc architectural vocabulary that would complement but not compete. And that's important to us because we don't want to try to mislead 
visitors. We don't want them to think this might be a, an outbuilding of Drayton Hall, but we wanted it to feel comfortable and to fit the space. And one thing that we seized on early was how could we tie it to the main house? And as you've seen in some of the renderings, there's these massive timber frame portals that run through the buildings. This is the gateway that brings you from the parking lot into the visitor center, onto the education center, into the house. And timber frames were not typically visible. Um, for those of you who may not know, a timber frame is, is heavy timber that's connected with mortise and tenon joinery. And that is just really beautiful construction. The workmanship and craftsmanship is amazing, but no, most people never see it because generally it's in the roof structure. There's a timber frame roof inside Drayton Hall, um, and that was just typical construction. But the way they make a timber frame is they will take a tree and they will hand hew the tree on a bench. They cut mortise and tenon joints, but each one is handmade so they're specific to each individual cut. There's no, no uh, mass production here. Each one's cut individually. And that means that they have to fit the same hole and the same mortise and tenon have to come together to, when they're constructing it, erecting it in the, in the attic. Well, you can imagine that could be problematic trying to fit A and B together. So they put um, Roman numerals. I'm sure some of you have seen Roman numerals on, on the roof structures. And it's really amazing, you know, a Roman numeral six tenon with a Roman numeral six mortise. And that's how they fit them together. But I've always been enamored with, with timber frames. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to be not only to celebrate the craft of timber framers, uh, but also to be educational to show people how structures were used and built. And I think it would be a great educational opportunity. Thank you. And <clears throat> Tony turning to you for a moment and taking a step back. You know, as we sit here tonight and we watch the video, we've seen the renderings, this starts to feel real. You know, it feels inevitable. It feels right. It feels like it's going to get done. Tell me about the board perspective and how you approached this 18 months, two years ago when, I mean, this is kind of a, this is a lot to take on. This is a lot of money to raise. This is a lot to do. How did the board approach that challenge? What, what made you think now was the right time? And how did you decide, okay, we're going to do it. We're really going to do it. Well, let's say the last 18 months or two years are only a small piece <laughs> of the conversation over many years that the site council and now the board have had. Uh, this is really a dream deferred that I think people have wanted for Drayton Hall. I'm, I wasn't around when it, all the original transaction happened, but I imagine this was a vision from the very beginning that this world-class site should have a visitor center of the same quality. I'd like to say somewhat jokingly, we've got a world-class site with third world visitor facilities at the moment. <laughs> that is going to change. But it's been a dream for a long time that was necessarily deferred by other pressing needs at Drayton Hall. A little thing called Hugo happened. Uh, there was an opportunity and, and an urgency to preserve the view of Drayton Hall, and that became a priority and then the need to make sure the house was stable. That became a priority. So all of those things had to be taken care of and finally got us to the point where this dream could then be moved forward. Uh, and it's been over the years through a number of iterations. And I think this is a case with many prob uh, projects. Over time, the idea gets refined and more refined. And I think we now have exactly the right program for the site and it's the right time. So the stars and the moon and the sun are all in alignment. And you know, finally, so taking us into modern history, the board then realizing that this was the time and the new governance structure has helped. And we can talk more about that for anyone who has questions. Nonprofit wonks in the audience, we can dig into that. But the new governance structure also created the right moment and the right board leadership to take this on. Um, so that's a little bit of the backstory. Terrific. Astrology, that's what I got out of that. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think that that actually is the, you'll correct me, uh, Carter C., but uh, the, uh, isn't, the motto, isn't the motto of the Drayton family up to the stars or something along those? This way to the stars. This way to the stars. Oh, so, so astrology nice. is part okay. of it. Okay. Very nice. I like, 
quickly, Sheila, before I come to you, Carter, let's 30 seconds on health stability of the estate. The, the centerpiece, we're doing this stuff around it. How's it doing? Um, I looked at Trish, our curator of historic architecture. <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't be doing this if the main house looks historic cold. architecture was not in a good place. Um, so for those of you in the audience that own old houses, you know your work is never done. Ours is never done, but we're healthy financially where we can launch an initiative like this, but still continue to invest in the crown jewel of Drayton Hall. Sheila, I'm going to give you what may be more of a philosophical question than a practical one. I'm curious, as you thought about the landscape environment, uh, the natural and design spaces that maybe aren't guided by signage or maybe environmental around the visitor experience, it, can visitors learn from that? Does that have an educational responsibility? Is it merely an aesthetic endeavor? What's your approach to thinking through that, knowing the history of the site and the goal to educate audiences that come to it? Mm, we were given just an incredible gift on this site because uh, the Drayton family and their interest in horticulture is remarkable. And uh, their documentation of that interest in the Drayton Diaries is also remarkable. So it was our initial idea, and I think everybody bought into it pretty quickly that we would illuminate and enrich these gardens with the plants that are highlighted in those diaries. And you know, you just don't get that opportunity. And so the whole courtyard garden with, um, that we're designing with the help of Eric Becker from Drayton Hall um, is gonna use and, and really rely on, on those plants. And you know, it's a wonderful, um, palette of, of plant material that a lot of it has gone way out of favor and uh, uh, a lot of it has uh, gone out of favor for a reason. It's no longer viable here. So we're winnowing through with what we can use and what we can't. But the main idea of the courtyard was much in the way that Glenn um, was inspired by uh, the, the bones of of parts of the hall's architecture, we were inspired not to try to recreate any historic garden or to try to pretend that this was a, a garden that we discovered and, and were restoring, but instead to give it a very clear geometry, <coughs> a very simple two-dimensional plane. It's basically a, a circle in a square focused on this not triumphant live oak, but a hell of a live oak, a good tree. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, overlay this very simple two-dimensional plan with a complex palette of these wonderful plants so that the horticultural interests of the Drayton family illuminated in the di diaries would, would show through in the courtyard. Good? Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. no, I'll take it. And, and, and bridging off of that, uh, Glenn, maybe talk to us for a second about material selection. How does the legacy of, of the estate and the history influence those selections, and how hard was it? I, I mean, imagine you're sourcing and looking for things that, that maybe aren't the easiest to, to, to find. Well, we are in Charleston, so we do have good resources for historic building materials and, and a great palette from which to choose. And we wanted to use materials that could have been used and were used at Drayton Hall and, and downtown as well in the 18th century. So, you know, our materials are slate roof and we have stucco walls and we have heart pine floors and our, our, um, the, we also have bluestone floors in the... Um, in the education center and, and brick paths. So it's all materials that you're familiar with, that you're comfortable with, and fit very nicely into a historic setting. Shifting gears slightly, Carter, I'm curious if you can help us understand. We, we've talked about the visitor experience. We know how that's going to be different. Help us understand what the impact's going to be on stewardship. How is this going to influence the research, the academic capabilities, the mission of the organization? Some of the stuff that we haven't seen and, and can't see at present because it's simply not displayed. What's the impact going to be? Right. Well, it, it's two or threefold, really. Um, 
Number one, I, I think many of you in the audience know that Drayton Hall has collections, but you've not necessarily seen them. Um, we're going to be able to connect visitors to the collection. And so we're going to take a number of our collections objects from um, less than desirable storage conditions and move those into a state-of-the-art gallery. So we will be improving the stewardship of collections in that manner. In addition to that, there's the main house. Uh, something that we continue to wrestle with is visitor access and historic preservation. Drayton Hall, when it was constructed 250 plus years ago, it was not constructed to handle the visitation load that we put on it now, 50, 60,000 people a year. So having this additional set of offerings, improvements on the landscape, improvements in access to collections in the gallery space, it should mitigate some of the stresses that we have on the main house right now. In addition to that, constructing galleries and investing in staff capacity with specialization in collections and collections-based research, it's opening a whole series of doors. One of the things that we're very passionate about now is that portable material culture, that, that filled Drayton Hall in the 18th and 19th century. And so working to identify those collections and where it's possible, bring those home to collections. So a charge to the audience, if you have or know of Drayton-related collections, we'd be interested in, in talking from a research standpoint to figure out what populated Drayton Hall. Um, I think that's an excellent cue. It is. We've got our, another brief video to show that's relevant. That's a great segue. If we can cue that up, and then we'll return to the questions. I'm Carter Hudgens. I'm the president and CEO of Drayton Hall. For the last 40 years, Drayton Hall has been incredibly successful as a house museum, welcoming visitors into the historic architecture of the Drayton Main House. In terms of historic house museums in America, Drayton Hall is unique as we have a wide palette of historical resources. From architecture to archeology, span we can tell the complete story of those that lived and worked at Drayton Hall. Despite its historical significance, the guest experience at Drayton Hall is less than desirable. At present, guests are only able to interact with a small portion of Drayton Hall's history. Everything from manuscripts to archeological artifacts are not on display and therefore not part of the guest experience. With the construction of the new Sally Reard Visitor Center, guests will now be able to interact with the full Drayton Hall history. I'm Trish Smith and I'm the Curator of Historic Architectural Resources. I'm really excited for Drayton Hall's new facilities because we've got such a big story to tell and only a one hour house tour to tell that story. So with new gallery space and orientation hall, we'll be able to share a much richer story than we're able to right now. I think we'll be able to expand upon the stories that we can tell around the house. So the house tour itself might not change very much, but we'll be able to kind of add some texture and really drill down into things that we want to share about the house. For instance, really detailed carvings or things that aren't on the house anymore. So we've got roofing materials, we can show a whole timeline of, of what's changed and what's gone missing over the years. So it'll be nice to be able to pull those threads together. Drayton Hall has extraordinary collections, furniture, ceramics, uh, also architectural fragments. A lot of people don't know about our fragment collection, and so that's something that we study all the time, and we learn new and important things about Drayton Hall by studying that collection. And so that's something that people are gonna see for the first time in our new gallery space, and we'll be able to share our new exciting discoveries that we've never shared with the public before. Drayton Hall is just such an extraordinary place and I think that'll be that much more obvious with our new facilities. I'm Sarah Stroud-Clark. I'm the Curator of Collections and Archaeologist at Drayton Hall. The preservation philosophy of Drayton Hall is really what makes it the most unique place that we have in the area. Uh, the house has been preserved instead of restored and from a collections aspect that makes it very unique because nothing is actually stored in the house and so as the curator of the collection it makes it really challenging but also very exciting in terms of the new facilities that we're building. One of the biggest challenges of my job as the curator is that most of our visitors aren't even aware that we have a collection 
And so for the first time ever, I'll be able to exhibit objects from our collection on the property. The Drayton Hall collections contain over 20 furniture objects, uh, which no one has ever really seen, uh, including a English-made bureau bookcase that is currently on display in Colonial Williamsburg, a Charleston-made linen press uh, that we now know is made by Jacob Sass, a Charleston cabinet maker. We also have two very early tables that probably date to around the time of John Drayton's very first marriage to Sarah Cattell that predate the building of Drayton Hall and those tables will go into our very first exhibit as well as a suite of furniture that we believe was actually created for Drayton Hall when he and we think Margaret Glenn moved into the house in the early 1750s. And then, of course, the archaeological collection that we also have. Uh, we estimate that there's over a million objects in that collection, and so those are on the ground and we're always finding them. I'm Cameron Moon. I'm the Preservation Coordinator at Drayton Hall. What I'm most excited about is what we can now do with the Caretaker's House. So it's really going to interpret a time period that people don't normally get to hear about, so it's going to be post-Civil War, all the way up until the National Trust purchased the property in 1974. And it's a really pivotal time period for this site because there were actual people living here. There was phosphate mining going on. That's what saved the house. There was an entire community of African Americans that were living here. And we have their names. We have photographs of them. We know what their houses looked like. We can actually see some of the remains of their houses on the site, but nobody knows that. And nobody knows that Drayton Hall is still standing in the condition that it is because of those people and because of that mining industry. I am Sheila Howell Roy, Curator of Education and Public Engagement. I am very excited about our new initiatives and programming based on the fact that we'll have a more robust interdepartmental collaboration. And the thought of being able to work with my curatorial staff in this way is not only dynamic, but it will definitely promise to make more productive programming. We'll also be able to expand with our community by um, having symposiums and workshops and lectures. So when we speak about social history, we would not have to just talk about these things. It's easier when students are able to see something and read it for themselves, or for that matter, touch and feel, which is what we're aiming for with this visitor center, is to have them do both. This will also bring about the relevance of our interpretation and show that we are accountable for showing these things as the fact base of what we convey to the public. Drayton Hall's collections are extremely important as they drive our interpretation. Interpretation at its core is a communication process. It's an engaging tool. We are able to more adapt and fully engage our audience by incorporating those collections, whether we do it on a level of historical, cultural, or scientific, they become more relevant in multi-perspectives. We are not able to just interpret these things but we're also able to expand upon them based on our collections. And I think in that way, it makes us more unique than other museums. Terrific, thank you. As promised, we're joined by Steve Gates. Never doubted you for a moment, sir. It's a <laughs> dramatic entrance if you missed it. Just came yeah. charging down the stairs. Uh, fair warning, at our conclusion, I might invite you to the stage to offer your perspective on this project and what it means to you. I've got a couple more questions for the panel, and then I want to turn it over to the audience. Um, because I can tell this is a pretty unruly mob, we'll do, we'll do it by show of hands. If you have a question, please raise it. I'll recognize you, and then we'll, we'll take that. So I'll do one or two more, but be thinking it's going to be your turn very soon. Um, Tony. To, to take another step back and think about the big picture here, we've referenced a couple times, you know, 40 years ago, the management model, the way Drayton Hall um, operates and oversees what it does. Help us, help this audience understand what occurred then, the, the way the organization governs itself and how that enabled a project like this. Give us that perspective, if you would. 
and we're going till 10. Is that the time tonight? For, for the, the, uh, the, uh, Three minutes or less. They, go for there it. you go. Uh, the, the short version is Drayton Hall is one of a number of sites owned by the National Trust, and it remains owned by the National Trust. And over the years, the Trust has experimented with a number of management structures for its historic sites. Uh, and so uh, Drayton Hall, for many years, was directly managed from Washington. Um, and the staff worked directly for the National Trust. Uh, and so that was the relationship, and the board was actually an advisory site council. Uh, and the trust has, over time, experimented with other models. And the other model that they were experimenting with, which is the model that we have now implemented here, uh, is something they call the co-stewardship model, where instead of the site being kind of managed from Washington, if you will, in terms of oversight, uh, instead, the trust remains the owner, but partners through a series of legal arrangements and understandings with a strong, locally-based nonprofit uh, with fiduciary responsibilities. The old site council, which was very energetic and very engaged and very involved, had no authority. <laughs> and, and so the involvement was always a little challenging because uh, you, you, know, you, weren't, you weren't really a board, but you were engaged. The new model is a traditional 501c3 fiduciary involved board of directors uh, from people all over the country. Uh, and because of that, it's, it's really engaged and focused and responsible and has a different sense of ownership. And I think that has really helped bring a level of expertise and engagement and commitment that's different because it's a different type of board. And I think that governance change along with other changes was part of what really set the stage for this. Uh, and so what's now in place is, I think, a really exemplary board with terrific leadership, uh, and I think with a, a level of commitment and engagement that really provides a secure management structure uh, to take the site into the future. Uh, and, and this is a board that very much takes its financial and physical responsibilities very seriously. So a lot of thought went into what was the right scale for this financially, what are the long-term implications on operations. So all of that was very carefully thought out and to the point of a great comfort level to say, now's the time, let's do it. I think that's exactly right. And if you read the paper today, this is a board and staff that have raised somewhere north of four million of their six plus million dollar goal. That is no small achievement, ladies and gentlemen. That, that is vision and leadership that I think we can all appreciate and that really underlines the comments you just made. And by the end of tonight, we're going to make the goal, right? We're, we're going to finish. Going, We've that's, actually that's locked the, the doors. Idea. The this doors is, are locked. The doors this are locked. <laughs> You're it. You're the final third. Um, no, at, at this point, I'll open it up to the audience. If there are questions, if there aren't, I'll continue. But if you have one, raise your hand, whether it's about design, architecture, inspiration, funding, anything else. Sir. Question for Sheila, preamble by my saying that, that I commend your looking back to the Drayton records for inspiration as to what plant material you use in the, in the garden setting for the, for the reimagined uh, center. I'm wondering what specifically you may have found in terms of plant lists or during the 18th and 19th century exchange of plants with people like John Bartram or Collinson or whoever, and I wonder if there are any specific guidelines or whether you have to imagine some of that. Um, it's, it's a combination. There are, um, I think, over 200 plants that are mentioned in the diaries. And as I alluded to, some of them I don't think uh, are any, are, are, were suitable when Charles Drayton was, was experimenting with them. Um, but some of them um, are commonly used today. And um, so we're taking a little bit of a risk. We're, we're um, within the actual courtyard itself, we're experimenting with some of the more de delicate plants um, to try and uh, uh, really bring that rich history, but we're fully aware that there may be some trial and error involved in it. Um, 
than as you move outside of the courtyard with the areas that are um, supporting the, the kind of the historic square. We're relying on uh, the plants and the diaries that were mostly natives um, that are tried and true <laughs> and um, that can provide that structure um, and but really be planted and be there hundreds of years from now so that um, the garden itself, uh, the, the plants within the square may change and, and uh, provide seasonal interest, for example, but that the greater landscape or the areas that were scarred by construction or uh, the areas within the parking lot um, are more native and reflect, you know, the flora of um, coastal South Carolina. Other questions? When's it gonna open? <laughs> Sir. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> hands. That's a good question in fairness. That's not bad, a actually, but hands. Actually, has got an answer. So I'm happy to announce that uh, Mark Hood, your crew delivered a, a portable restroom on site today. So that's a first, first step. Uh, no, in all seriousness, um, the tree protection, the silt fencing, all those important pre-construction steps have taken place, including the Port of John. Heavy machinery starting to show up. It should be a 10 to 12 month construction project. Having said that, we are gonna have the installation of that courtyard garden, the installation of the gallery. Um, so we're looking about this time next year. Other, other hands that would signal a question, <laughs> <laughs> shouted questions. I knew this would be a difficult audience. I'm curious, uh, there's Carter. A there's a hand, I see. There's, well, oh, really? there's a hand. Thank you, ma'am, appreciate that, a subtle hand. I have to say my favorite aha goosebump moment is when I drive coming off 61 and go up that drive and see the house for the first time. You talked about changing how we're going to get into the parking area, right. but are you going to take away my aha moment? <laughs> I want this one. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, I, I, one, one of the um, things that we contend with today, and you may want to I definitely on. want to. All right. <laughs> Sheila, take it away. One, one of the um, very first things that we started thinking about was that aha moment, that sense of arrival, and this being such an opportunity to enhance that visitor's experience. Historically, obviously, people visited the house from the river, so they approached the house from the other side. But still, as you say, turning right off of uh, Ashley River Road is pretty spectacular. And so, at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we never diminished that experience. We also wanted to make sure that vehicles and the car in general was totally abolished from the site. So once you drive down that narrow dirt carriageway and you see that glorious house surrounded by lawn, and I remember you saying, Mr. Duell, there's something really elegant about an expanse of lawn, and you should know. Uh, mm -hmm. But that once you, you had that experience that we're pulling the cars off to the left and that you drive through the woods, um, we've designed, I think, a really elegant, very low-key uh, native plant uh, wooded parking lot where people will get out of their cars, leave them, come uh, walking through the visitor center, experience the center and the courtyard gardens, and then approach the house, not as you used to from the side of the privy and kind of the side of the house as if you were sneaking up, but coming around to the front of the house. So you then have that aha moment again. But now as a as a, as a visitor on foot um, with no cars anywhere around. So I, we get exactly what your concern was and is, and I think we've preserved it and enhanced it. 
Terrific. We'll, we'll take more questions. I'll ask my timekeeper in the back to scream if we drift too far past seven. But other questions about construction or design? I have one while you're thinking. Carter, maybe this is for you. Are we still open? Are we blocking the road? Do we still have visitors during construction? What's happening between now and next year? We will remain open. Um, there are a couple of tweaks that we've had to implement to direct traffic into our overflow parking lot. Uh, that'll happen in the weeks to come. Um, we've moved our museum shop slash welcome center into the Kennedy Library. So between that parking lot, between that Kennedy Library, folks will still be able to access the site, engage with their guides, and carry on with that house tour and the connections program as they do today. So no, the goal is to remain open. There may be a little added noise, but it's a little excitement as well. Um, I think folks visiting the site will like to see the, the buildings come out of the ground. A great way to keep up is just come on out and see what they've built. Encourage everyone, just drive up and you'll see. Questions? Tony, while, while they're pondering other questions, take us into the future. If we're doing all of this now, if this is going to be built and we've got visitors arriving maybe even a calendar year-ish from now, help me understand the future of the site from a five-year, ten-year perspective. How does the board think about that and how does this project influence that vision? Well, I, I don't think I can speak for the board <laughs> because I think we haven't had a, a, a firm, you know, policy-related thing, but vision-wise, uh, I think this is seen as really a first phase. Of, of what the site needs programmatically. Uh, we still uh, have some wonderful offices and what some people might call trailers or things that look mm -hmm. like trailers. Uh, and there are you know, more collections than we'll be able to exhibit in this space. So I think down the road, uh, depending on how this goes and, and what surprises are you know, down the road, there will be a second phase uh, to help fulfill kind of those other needs. There was a very conscious decision to make to, to address the most pressing needs now, but in a comprehensive way that set the stage for future expansion in a coordinated way. But we also, you know, we're a very appropriately conservative board. I mean, in a sense, this is a house that's been there for a very long time, and it's going to be there for a very long time. So changes should be done very thoughtfully uh, and very prudently, and that's kind of the path. So I, I would imagine as, as the, after the great grand opening, after we've exceeded the campaign goal, uh, of course, uh, and the grand opening, and I think there'll be a lot of national attention on the site. It's already getting attention. I think there'll be more. So I think we'll see an increase in programming, uh, and I think a kind of an increased level of activity. As Carter was saying, one of the interesting challenges from a kind of a stewardship effect is Drayton Hall is a fragile resource it's built of bricks. You think bricks are going to be there forever. So in a sense, we have to manage the stress we put on that building. So I think the more we create other opportunities, as Carter said, for people to come to Drayton Hall, learn about it and experience it without necessarily everyone having to troop up and down the entire house is also part of a long-term stewardship strategy. So I think we'll see more offerings that allow people to experience the site in different ways, but also take into the account, this is a building we want to be there for the next 200 plus years, if, if not more. And so that's always in our mind as anything is being contemplated, as it should be. Sure. We'll do a couple more, and yes, ma'am, right here. We'll do a couple more, and then, uh, Mr. Gates, I'll turn it over to you. Where are, is the collection currently housed? And those items that are at Williamsburg, are you sure they're going to allow you to take them back? <laughs> <laughs> Where do I start? Yeah. <laughs> the collection is stored all over the southeast. Um, I, I say that jokingly. As you know, there are some 30-odd objects that are at Colonial Williamsburg on loan until February of 2019. And as our curator of collections, Sarah Stroud-Clark, will tell you, Dealing with the collection is somewhat complex because there are a series of objects that were donated to Drayton Hall prior to the co-stewardship transition in 2015. Those objects are owned by the National Trusts, but Sarah curates them. Objects that we've received after 2015, 
January 2015, are the property of the Drayton Hall Preservation Trust. So in addition to your archaeological role, <laughs> you curate multiple collections on the National Trust or the DHPT. Um, the, the objects are in Williamsburg. There are a couple of objects that are at the Hayward Washington House on loan in downtown Charleston. Our manuscript collection is at the Addleston Library, and that includes uh, documentary records as, Laura, as well as the uh, Lenhart collection of George Edwards watercolors. We have objects on site, both the archaeological collection as well as some of the decorative arts. And so eventually, it will be great to have everything under one roof, but it's going to take a series of steps to get there. And this is the introductory step to begin to bring the first wave of collections back to Drayton Hall and, and into that, that gallery space. And I should mention, sorry, um, we do have objects on loan to the Smithsonian at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, so we're always willing to loan objects, but loan is the key word. Um, they will come back to Drayton Hall. Uh, just highlight a few of those? Absolutely. And I'll, I will open that up. If anybody is interested in seeing what the collection is in its current state, ahead of conservation, ahead of exhibition, feel free to, to reach out to myself or to Sarah. We're always happy to, to connect you in these proceeding th uh, stages. Um, new objects that have come to Drayton Hall, it is everything from quilts that were made by either enslaved or emancipated African Americans. Um, we have, I'll casually refer to it as John Drayton's liquor chest. Um, we have John Drayton's traveling writing slope, a gentleman's desk. We have received a very rare late 19th century Charleston made urn stand, of which there are only five known in existence. We have received a turntop pedestal table that may be made by the Charleston uh, cabinet maker Thomas Elf. I'm looking at Sarah. There's some very rare silver that folks will have to be introduced to on the site. So it's a very diverse series of objects that have come back to Drayton Hall. And again, um, we're always interested to learn more about Drayton related collections that people have either at home or uh, in, a, in a public institution. Are there any pressing needs for maintenance to Drayton Hall itself at present? Looking at Trish again, our curator. <laughs> you should define pressing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, as I mentioned before, we wouldn't be embarking on such a construction of new facilities if there was not a level of comfort with the historic resources. So, Drayton Hall, there's always things that we need to do to keep up with uh, the preservation of that structure. Looking five years out, there is going to need to be an initiative to stabilize the stair hall, both the ceiling and the stairs themselves, as well as circling back to repairs that were done at Drayton Hall in the mid-1970s as part of the National Trust, opening that up to the public. So preservation is an ongoing thing. Um, we have a level of comfort, though, and um, we're, we're in a good space to move forward with new construction. Let me ask one more, and then, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Carter, Tony, anybody, help us understand, you know, perspective is a funny thing. For those of us who are from here or live here, we're familiar with Drayton Hall, and we know it in the context of what's available or visitable within the Lowcountry. Help us understand the importance of the site as it pertains to the story of colonial America nationally. Where does this rank? How does it fit into that narrative? And as you and I have talked about before, if I just, you know, came down from Mars and had no idea about any of this, where does it fit on the list of sites I might visit to understand that story of the colonial American experience? Number one. I was going to say, <laughs> top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Drayton Hall is interesting, and we can, we can classify it in a variety of ways. The first fully executed Palladian uh, domestic structure in the colonies, uh, one of the most significant elite estates in the colonies. And it's interesting to look at those credentials historically, but then look at it today and what's happening on the site. It's clear that it was of historical significance. It was not necessarily the, the home seat of a president, so it's remained lower on the, the radar. 
But you look at what's going on on the site today with the staff, with the level of preservation, and with the cutting edge research that's taking place across the board. Architecture, archaeology, decorative arts, landscape. As I mentioned in, in that short video clip, we have the complete picture of life on that estate. And what that does is paint a picture of how one became American in that first or very early stage of American history in the 18th century. So whether it is young John Drayton purchasing the property, really promoting himself as an American-born Englishman, um, or whether it is the lives of the enslaved people that lived and worked on the site. We have the material culture to flesh out their story, and I think it's now our job to unpack that. And we've been successful thus far, but there's a long way to go. So I think stay tuned as, as the staff continues to, to push ahead. There will be incredibly rich stories that flesh out not only the low country, but the process of becoming American. Let me just, just add, I think one of the most exciting things about Drayton Hall is what we continue to learn about it. I mean, when I first encountered Drayton Hall, there was a narrative about it that was exciting and compelling. And now, umpteen years later, that narrative has been so enriched and expanded by the ongoing research that you know, for a site that you think you may know, or you might think we know everything we're going to know about it, I mean, I'm waiting for you to send a researcher over to England and find out if John Drayton actually was educated there. I mean, there's so many fun things we want to learn that I think the, it's, what's exciting to me is it's just an ongoing work in progress in our knowledge. And as we learn more, the story gets richer. So I think that's what the future holds. And, and just circling back to that as well, I think it's important to acknowledge that it's not just the 18th century. There's an awful lot of emphasis that's placed on the 18th century, but as Cameron illustrated in her portion of the video and the work that she does on a daily basis, we're talking about examining American history from, in truth, the late 17th century up to the present. And so the caretaker's house, as she illustrated, that's a, a tremendous vehicle to understand what happened on that site and across the, nature, uh, across the nation during that period of emancipation through the early 20th century. So it's the complete story. Thank you. At this time, I'll welcome Steve Gates, Drayton Hall Preservation Trust Board Chair to the stage for some closing comments. I want to thank the panel. Really appreciate everything you had um, to offer. If you'll just stay put. Steve, I'll turn this over to you. And audience, appreciate the questions, and thank you so much for your interaction and participation. Steve. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the whole uh, session, but glad to make it for the tail end. My job was to sort of wrap up and make a pitch. So I think I'm here just in time to, uh, to do that. Um, I'm, these are brief remarks. I think you've uh, heard from ample uh, reporters here all of the wonderful stuff that's going on in connection with the new visitor center. I think you probably caught from Tony Wood the enthusiasm of the Board of Trustees for, for this project to finally give Drayton Hall what it's richly deserved for so long, a proper set of visitor facilities to appropriately use the grounds, appropriately focus on the collection, and appropriately educate and orient the visitor toward the history uh, of the house. I think you've learned from Carter the enthusiasm of the staff for um, being able to have the facilities to do all of those things and do their job uh, that much better and, and, uh, and more richly. Um, you've heard from our main design people, uh, Glenn and Sheila, uh, how we're doing this with uh, great attention, not to intrude upon the house, to come up with an extremely quality uh, facility and a quality setting uh, using quality materials that uh, everybody can be very, very uh, proud of. Um, the new board that Tony described in our government, governance, which is increasingly becoming a national board, had two major accomplishments in its first uh, two years in existence. It, it installed Carter as president and CEO of the Trayton Hall Preservation Trust. And under our new uh, coach stewardship, all the enthusiasm of himself and the board for thinking big just came to the forefront. That big thinking came to what can we do that we can do now? Not pie in the sky 15 years from now, not something that'll take forever to raise the money and design, but something we can actually break ground for open in a reasonable period of time. And we said a visitor facility, we'll wait to give the staff new offices. 
but enhance the visitor experience. So that's exactly what, uh, what we're doing. It's been amazing that uh, uh, Carter and Steve Mount in a little over a year have raised four and a half million dollars toward that objective. The board has stepped up uh, graciously and largely uh, to contribute to that. We have a number of longtime uh, large contributors who were equally enthused about this project. We've had a number of major naming opportunities that have been taken as part of this construction project. We still have a couple left at the <laughs> high end of the ticket. Um, we do envision a permanent plaque of recognition for donors who uh, pledge over time uh, a $25,000 contribution. But we welcome any contribution between a dollar and $25,000 because the cumulative effect of that at this point is going to raise that last million and a half dollars that make this um, fully paid for at the end of its construction period, which would be a phenomenal accomplishment. <clears throat> so I ask you if you haven't already considered a donation to, to do so. Uh, if you need more information, Carter would be more than willing to provide it. If you want to see a particular part of the operations of the collections, just ask. Uh, otherwise, you can write a check that just in the corner says new visitor facility or fill out a pledge card or talk to Steve Mount. So that's my summary and that's my pitch. And thank you all for coming. I don't know if I'm, I'm mic'd anymore. In, in addition to Steve, I thank you all for coming. There is our campaign website, DraytonHallReimagined.org, and all is there to help you make a contribution towards the campaign, as long or as well as the videos that you saw tonight and other updates that will be coming in the coming months. So thanks to everybody, and look forward to seeing you on site.